Recording is enabled. Hello, everybody. Um, we are starting now. Can everyone hear me now? We only have a few people online. That's fine. I assume the rest will watch later. Um, Danny, Gwendolyn, Carl, can everyone hear me all right? Oh, good. Okay. I had the wrong window open. Hold on a second. This is our first time using this WebEx, and uh, you guys are guinea pigs, but I think you'll benefit from it because I think that we'll have uh, no crashes and dropouts like we've had in the past. Ethan, turn that other light on here, please. Turn the other bright light on. Uh, Donald Koss says he cannot hear. Let me see if I can add you, Donald. Okay, Donald, can you hear me now? Can everyone hear me now? Donald, can you hear? Restart audio. I'll restart audio. Hold on a second. Donald, can Okay, I restarted. Now, Donald, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me now? I see a little uh, – oh, okay, now I see the earphone symbol in Donald. Donald, can you hear now? Donald, hello. Oh, good, good. Uh, okay. Um, Danny, if you see anyone join that I'm not noticing we have uh, uh, that I need to add as a panelist, let me know. Um, because I might not notice it. Uh, welcome, everybody. Glad to uh, have you all online. This course is – I think we have about 17, 18 students. We may have a few more join during the week. This is a smaller course, so this may give us more time to uh, address questions, which is perfectly fine with me. We had around 70 or 80 the first go-round for this course, and my last course, uh, uh, Libertarian Legal Theory, which just ended a couple weeks ago, we had 100 and – something students. Uh, so this is a smaller course, so maybe we'll have a more intimate setting. And uh, we've had some technical problems with the previous um, uh, service we used, Dim Dim. We're trying something new this time. Uh, this is the first time we've used it, so in the chat session, I'm going to say hello right now. Uh, hold on a second. You'll see that my name shows as Danny Sanchez, and so does Danny, so we'll get that fixed for next time. But Danny's our sort of technical host um, supporter here. He's a TA kind of guy and runs the whole Mises Academy. So you'll see he's here, and so am I. Anyway, it's good to be here. Um, since we have such a small class this time, I'd be glad to answer questions as we go if they are on point. I will stop and read them for people that are listening later or in the audio only. Okay, so tonight is lecture one of the – of the course, and tonight's uh, topic is history and the law, the law of IP and the history of IP. Let me see if I can figure this new system out. Go to slide one. Uh, just a brief introduction to myself. Some of you already know me from the previous course. Um, Jock Coates, who's not here now. I guess Jock will uh, listen remotely later. Um, two of the uh, students are friends of mine, Jock, who – did the audio narration for my Against Intellectual Property book, and John McGinnis, who I've known for maybe 15, 20 years. He was a uh, professor at a local economics college in Pennsylvania when I used to live in Philadelphia. So I'll be glad to interact with John, too. Um, before we go on, Danny, I see that there's an X next to Carl Fielding's name. I'm not sure what that means. Carl, can you hear me okay? Are you there all right? Hello? Okay. I don't know what the X means. Jeez. Crap. Grab that. That's the second one. Yeah. So I just want to explain who I am. I'm a patent attorney. Now, this course is not about me, but just to give you an idea of who your professor is and where I'm coming from, 
Uh, I'm a patent lawyer. I'm also a, a libertarian scholar and a writer. Um, and I've been influenced heavily by Ayn Rand initially in my thinking, and then later on by more Austrian and anarchist thinkers like Rothbard and others. Um, as I said, I'm a lawyer, and I've uh, had about an 18-year law firm career with law firms in Houston and Philadelphia, practicing intellectual property law, uh, including patent law. Thank you. Uh, my main influences, and I'll draw on these a lot in this course, are going to be uh, the uh, austro mizesian Rothbardians, primarily uh, Mises, Rothbard, and Hamba. And you'll see as we go on how I um, draw on them. Going to slide four. A brief overview of the course. Um, and I've done this once already, so I, I actually re listened today to my first lecture that I'm giving now. So some of this I may streamline a bit because I realize now some of it I can speed up. I tended to go over my time and have less time for QA. Um, I think we can uh, streamline it a little bit better this time. But just a quick overview of the course. We're going to have six lectures, and today's lecture, number one, is the history and law of uh, IP, an overview of modern IP law. I'm going to talk about uh, its historical origins um, and actually what the types of IP are and it, give an overview of its justifications, the, the reasons people have given to explain why we think they think we should have IP law. Now, just to be clear, I'm not going to go into IP law in enough legal detail to enable you guys to practice this. Uh, this is not a law school course. Um, and that would be kind of boring anyway. Uh, Danny, Donald has lost the video window. I'm not sure how he gets it back. Maybe you can advise Donald Koss how to get his video window back. He emailed me privately about that. Donald, I'm not sure. You can't be quiet, baby. Okay, so next next week's lecture, we'll talk about property scarcity ideas, uh, sort of a uh, general overview of, of this aspect of IP. And then number three, we'll talk about the utilitarian case for IP. Um, number five, we're going to talk about how to uh, – number four, we're going to examine rights-based arguments for intellectual property. Number five, we're going to try to integrate intellectual property theory with Austrian economics and libertarian theory. And then in the final uh, lecture of the course, we're going to talk about different reforms that are proposed, what's, co what's coming up, things we can do, and how a non-IP world would work, and also the future of open versus closed. So let's go on and jump right into lecture one. And let me just um, – uh, I'm going to emphasize here there are two books, resources that we'll refer to a lot in this course. Excuse me. Let's just hold on a second. Donald Koss is having um, a little bit of a, a problem here. Um, let's take a, a quick break. Hey, let's just take a um, let's take a two minute break while Donald and Danny try to get Donald back online. I'll be right back and grab some more water. Okay, let's resume, and I'm hoping Donald can catch up and um, you guys get your problem solved, but let's keep going to avoid uh, delaying the lecture too much. So the two main texts for the course will be um, my monograph against intellectual property, which I'm going to call AIP here, which is available online, 
and there's links on the course materials for this. Um, also, the book Against Intellectual Monopoly by Boulder and Levine. So my book is more of an Austrian libertarian principled approach, and the book by Boulder and Levine is more of an economic empirical approach. Uh, they complement each other well, I believe. Um, anyway, I have here on, on slide five sort of the uh, a list of the resources that are relevant to today's lecture. And you can look at that later or on the resources for the course page for today. Okay, so what we're going to talk about first is um, the main question for um, – I'm going to minimize the chat session because this is distracting me for right now. Okay, so the main question that we have to face is what is intellectual property, and is it a type of property? So we all we're aware that there's a type of property called real property, and this is in the common law system. Real property is land. Okay, um, in the civil law systems of the world, which is the second major legal system of the world, uh, which is most of Europe. Um, Quebec and Canada and uh, Louisiana and America, Puerto Rico, et cetera, this is the civil law systems. We would call this immovable property. So that's one type of property. Um, then a second type of property is personal property. Uh, these are movable things, which is what you call them in civil law systems, movable things, um, cars, apples, or gold, or even your body, although your body is held to be a special type of property. Okay. So then the question is, is intellectual property a legitimate type of property? So then the question is, what is intellectual property? Okay, I'm going on to slide um, seven now. So here – let me just give a definition. I'm going to try to have a calm – just – don't freak out about this because IP is hard to understand at first. In a way, it's hard to understand in purpose uh, because of purposeful sort of um, uh, over overly complex ways of describing the law by lawyers and specialists, right? It's sort of our domain, and so we have our own jargon. We have our own lexicon, et cetera. So it, it seems alienating and highly technical, but… Basically, the word IP is a fairly modern concept, uh, which actually was adopted for propaganda purposes, which we'll learn later. Um, but it, it basically is a term that covers um, several types of – excuse me – legally recognized rights. Okay? Now, they all – they're all lumped together. They're all different. They have some things in common. They're lumped together. It's, it's, it's what's called an umbrella term. So it's a concept that covers several different types of legal rights, and they all have something to do with intellectual creativity right? or something that's valuable that's not really a material, scarce thing, something that's valuable because of what your mind has done. So IP rights are rights to intangible or what you could say immaterial things, that is to ideas. Okay. As expressed or as embodied in practical <laughs> implementations. Okay. Um, now, Tom Palmer, who's one of the uh, uh, intellectual property philosophers who has influenced me, um, he refers to intellectual property as being a right to ideal objects. Okay. So, in other words, if you imagine you have a certain type of idea, then the right to an IP is not just to the, the particular thing that that's instantiated in, but it's, that it's a right to that idea itself, and therefore it's a right to everything it's instantiated in. So, for example, a copyright is a right to a novel, for example, but the novel is not just a physical book that you might be holding. It's, it's, it's a right to that ideal object. I, Gwendolyn says, is it like a platonic ideal? I think it actually is like a platonic ideal. And as we'll see later, as we, as we look at this, um, at, the, at the implications of this, um, you can't really protect legally a right to a platonic ideal. The only way you can protect it is to actually 
uh, resolve that in terms of some kind of rights in material goods in the real world. So really, the entire idea of property rights and ideal objects or intellectual property always amounts to some kind of assignment of property rights to material goods or to scarce goods in the real world, um, which is one problem with them, which we'll get to in more detail later. Okay, so what exactly do we mean by intellectual property? And by the way, a lot of the IP abolitionists, of which I'm one, um, some, of, some of them oppose even using the idea of IP, intellectual property. They think that you're giving too much away by using the term of the proponent. Um, I, I understand that complaint, but I think we also have to communicate with people that we're arguing with and disagreeing with and trying to persuade. And you know, the term that's used now is intellectual property. I mean, there's lots of other terms that have been proposed, like intellectual uh, property or intellectual um, uh, poverty or intellectual monopoly or pattern privileges. Um, but for now, I think we're going to use the word intellectual property. But it covers disparate sets of legal rights. Now, there are four traditional uh, types of IP. And I've got patent and copyright listed here, and I've got them bolded because those are the two biggest ones that are the two biggest problems. And that's the ones we're going to focus on in this course. Um, so patenting, copyright, also trademark and trade secret. Um, now, as a subset of copyright, I have moral rights and common law copyright. Um, and as a subset of trademark, I have domain name implications. So we have different ways of breaking these things down. So let me briefly explain what they are. Um, a patent right is basically a monopoly privilege granted by the state. It's the right to exclude someone else from making or using or selling the practical invention that you have a property right in. Okay, so it can be a gizmo or a process or something like that. So patents cover functional, practical, useful inventions. Okay. Copyright protects the, the original expression of an idea. So this is what covers artistic creations like novels, paintings, and even the way you write a software program. Not the way it works, but the way it's expressed when you actually write it, like you think of it like a novel. Uh, moral rights, uh, which is more of a European concept, is sort of the idea that there's an inalienable right to be recognized as the author of something, even if you don't own the rights to the copyrights to it anymore. And it's called a, it's, it's said to be an inalienable because you can't give it away. So someone has to recognize you as the author of a given painting, for example, or movie, even if you uh, have no uh, copyright in it anymore. <clears throat> Common law copyright is uh, talked about on occasion. Most people don't understand it. I don't even understand it quite completely because it's not really in effect anymore, and it's not described very well. Give me a second. There's some newer people that have added. I'm going to add you guys as panelists. Okay, everyone's a panelist now. Yeah, all right. So um, common law copyright, the original idea of common law copyright was a very limited doctrine under the common law, which said if you were the author of an unpublished manuscript, so let's say you wrote a novel or a book and it's in your desk drawer and you've never published it, then if someone takes it from you and tries to publish it, you could use your common law copyright to stop them. So it was a very limited right, pretty much unrelated to what the modern copyright law does. Um, in a way, it was more similar to um, a trade secret, which we'll get to next. So trade secret is the is simply recognizes the fact that sometimes, let's say a company or a businessman has information that he has secret, that he keeps proprietary to himself, which gives him some kind of competitive advantage. It could be something that could have been copyrightable. It could have been something that could have been uh, patentable, or maybe not. But it's basically something that he keeps secret that gives him an advantage in competition. Trade secret law says if you make reasonable efforts to keep this information secret, then you can go to court 
and prevent someone else from leaking the information to the world, so long as it's not generally public yet. Now, a trademark just means a mark that you use in trade or in, just in, in commerce to identify the source of your goods or your services. Okay, so basically, the root of trademark is in consumer confusion or fraud. So, in a way, you can see that trade secret and trademark are not as problematic in their origins as patent and copyright, which we, which we haven't gotten to yet. But the point is, you can see already that um, trade secret basically says you can keep something secret that you're trying to keep secret, and you can stop someone from re revealing the secret who has no right to. Trademark just says you shouldn't deceive consumers about um, the source of goods. Now, there, um, so these are the big four type of trade, uh, IP rights, patent, copyright, trademark, and trade secret. Now, there's another classical right called defamation. Well, it's actually called reputation rights, but it's protected by what's called defamation, which is a cause of action. Now, you've probably heard of libel, slander, defamation. Let me just give you a quick uh, primer on what these words mean. Defamation means uh, publicizing some kind of communication about someone that is false and that damages their reputation. Now, libel is a type of defamation, and so is slander. Libel is the written form of, defama of defamation, and you can remember that because libel and written both have an I in them. Slander is the oral form of defamation, Okay, so basically they're defamation. So defamation – the defamation cause of action is based upon the idea of a right in your reputation. You build up your reputation. It has value, and you can protect it from being uh, diminished. Now, in my view, this should be classified as a type of IP because it's got the same motivation, and it's got the same problems as well. It's not usually called a type of IP, but I think it should be. Now, there are newer types of IP that have come about, let's say, in the last 50, uh, 30, 40 years. Um, one is a database rights, which is not the law in, mo in, in the U.S. yet, but it could be at some point. Um, database rights, let me explain how that arose. Um, under the copyright law, you have a copyright in original works of authorship. That is, in the in the original way that an idea is expressed. The problem was there was a Supreme Court case called Feist, F-E-I-S-T, maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, which said that you cannot have copyright in factual compilations of data like a database or a map, for example, or a telephone book because these are just pure collections of data that have nothing original about them. Now, until the Feist case, there was a doctrine under U.S. law called sweat of the brow, sweat of the brow. And what that said was if you put a lot of effort into collecting data that is valuable, then – which is called you know sweat of the brow. You put a lot of work into it. Then the fact that you labored on it would substitute for the originality requirement. In other words, even though it wasn't really original in the copyright sense, we would count that as original, um, and it could be subject to copyright. Well, the Feist case, the Supreme Court said, well, you would just do that. Um, uh, sweat of the brow might be worth rewarding, but the copyright law doesn't reward it because it has to reward originality. There's really nothing original in a map because a map is a factual depiction of what the surface of the earth you know, and roads look like, so it's not original. Um, excuse me. Um, and this is why some countries uh, – some people have advocated for us to implement a database, right, which would actually give a legislative protection to the things that uh, are not – any longer protected in the U.S. anyway by copyright law, like maps and databases and phone books and things like that. Um, I haven't seen much agitation for this lately. It was around 10 years ago. I believe there are database rights in some countries. Okay. Some other types of newer IP innovations would include um, semiconductor mask work protection, which is a unique U.S. law, maybe 30 years old, which protects the way a circuit is laid out. In a semiconductor mask work, uh, you know, for these integrated circuits that are made by companies like Intel 
in my company, which is a laser company, um, there was an amendment to the copyright law, I think about 15 years ago, which added boat hull or vessel hull designs. So you could actually get a protection on the way the front of a boat hull looks or something like that. So it's a very narrow, specialized type of IP right, which obviously was passed at the behest of some special interest. And there's continual agitation to add new IP laws. Uh, like right now, there's uh, agitation to add uh, rights to protect fashion designs. Um, sometimes uh, some um, bartenders are asking for copyright in recipes for bar drinks. Chefs are asking for copyrights in recipes, um, and so on. So this is what the four main types of IP are. Any questions at this point that I can address? With? I'll, I'll go into some of these in detail right now. If there's any questions, feel free to chat them right now through the session. I'll be happy to address them right now. And let me check and see. If, I think there have been some that have joined. Let me make sure and see if there's any I need to add. Yeah. Okay. John just added. Welcome, John and uh, Matt. Glad to see you guys here. Okay. So we're just discussing the types of IP, a, a sort of legal overview of what IP consists of. Um, now, copyright is a statutory – so there's a huge statutory scheme in the U.S. and in almost every other country, uh, and they're all largely compatible with each other because of what's called the Berne Convention, B-E-R-N-E, -E, the Berne Convention. Um, so a copyright is a legal right that's given to authors, and the author is the one who writes it or creates it, of an original work like a book or an article or a movie or a computer program or a painting. Okay. It's given to you automatically as soon as you fix it. It's called fixing it in a tangible medium of expression. Okay. Let me see if I have that covered on the next slide. If not, I'll go into it in detail here. And yeah, I do. Okay, so just I'll, I'll deal with that on slide 11. Now, what rights are you given as the author of a copyright, the holder of a copyright? Well, you're given the exclusive right to reproduce the work, but also another set of uh, rights called uh, to prepare derivative works and to perform or present the work publicly. So it's not just the right to reproduce it, which, which is what copy means. So copyright is more than just the right to authorize the copying of the work. Um, so copying or reproducing means the literal reproduction of a work. Okay, like if you take an MP3 file and you make an exact duplicate, that would be literal reproduction. But if you, you know, you look at the Mona Lisa and you paint it yourself and you try to duplicate it, and it's close but it's not exact, that would be a reproduction but not exact re reproduction. But that would also be copyright infringement if the Mona Lisa were still in copyright. Now, if you made um, Mona Lisa's brother sort of another painting based upon that one. That would be a derivative work. Now, you're entitled to do that now because that work is in the public domain, but if it were copyrighted, you couldn't without permission of the owner uh, or to perform the work publicly. And that's a complicated one that, that depends upon the situation, whether it's digital, whether it's broadcast, whether it's live, etc. cetera. Um, now, you have to remember that copyright protects only the form or the expression of an idea, not the underlying idea. Um, the functionality of the way something works is protected by, say, patent perhaps, okay? but the way it's expressed is what copyright protects, and the way it looks. And what this right does is it basically gives you the right to go to the courts and to ask the court to issue an injunction or to get damages from someone. Basically, it lets you stop someone else from using their own property in a certain way if they're so-called infringing your copyright, like if they're, if they're rearranging their own property with your pattern or if they're making a derivative work with your, with your property. So that's what the copyright is. And again, as I said, it protects original works of authorship that are fixed 
in the tangible form of expression. So for example, if I think of a new song and I sing it to an audience for the first time, but it's not recorded, there's no copyright yet in that song. It's got to be recorded or fixed in some medium. You've got to write it down or record it or something like that. Okay. As I said, it's, it's a bundle of rights, including primarily the right to reproduce, which includes literal reproduction and um, non-literal reproduction. That's reproduction that's not buried too much. Um, the right to prepare derivative works and the right to present the work publicly. Okay. Now, copyright lasts at this current time for the life of the author plus 70 years. Okay, so if you uh, write a novel when you're 30 and you die when you're 90, so that the 60 years of term and then another 70, so 130 years of term. Um, if it's a work for hire, then it lasts 95 years. Now, a work for hire basically means it's, it's a statutory category of copyright. What this means is if the creator of a work makes a written contract with someone else, typically their employer, um, by which the employer pays them to create these types of works, and the contract specifically says in writing that this is a work for hire. It actually has to say it's a work for hire. In that case, then not only does the employer own the copyright, uh, which which you could do by assignment. For example, I have copyrights in materials I've written. I could assign them to someone else tomorrow with an assignment, but I'm just transferring ownership. I'm still the author, but I've assigned the ownership of the copyright to someone else. Um, but the term is the same. It would be my life for 70 years. And a work for hire, if you have a contract ahead of time which says it's a work for hire, then the company that basically – is the one paying for it is le legally the author. Legally, they are the author. Um, and in that case, the term is 95 years total, usually because it's a corporation which doesn't have a life. Okay, But basically, you can think of a copyright as having about 100 years life, so it's a very long time. It's the longest of all the IP except – well, trade secret can last forever, and trademarks can be renewed indefinitely. Now, what's important to recognize is that ever since 19 – I think it was 82 or maybe 78, I can't remember the date um, – when the U.S. acceded to the Berne Convention, okay, um, and we changed our copyright law to comply with the Berne Convention, which is an, an international treaty which has copyright standards which every signatory nation is supposed to comply with. Um, let me see if we have any more attendance now I need to add. Excuse me. Oh, no. There's no more ones. Okay, so um, what's important to notice is that copyright is automatic. You need to think about this because you will hear people over and over and over again misstate the law. They'll say like um, – for example, you'll hear people criticize the Mises Institute uh, or me for hypocrisy. They'll say, well, you're against copyright, and yet you copyrighted your, your article or your book. Well – this is a complete confusion. No one copyrights their book. Everyone that writes a book has a copyright in it, whether they want it or not. This is completely automatic. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether you put a copyright notice in your book or not. It has nothing to do with whether you file a copyright registration. Under the Berne Convention, it eliminated what's called formalities. That is, in other words, countries may not require formalities. Before copyright attaches, they can't require you to pay a fee. They can't require you to put notice on your work. They can't require you to register it actively. It has to be automatic. So basically, all these charges that you, why did you copyright your book? Well, I didn't copyright my book. What, what they're saying is, we, I see a copyright notice in your book. So therefore, you're hypocritical. Well, but it's true that I have a copyright in my book. The state gives me a copyright in my book, whether I want it or not. Whether I say it or not, it's there. So I'm just stating the truth, and putting the date in there is useful for some purposes. And stating that I'm the copyright holder is useful because now people know who to come to to ask permission to reprint it. 
So you have to remember that copyright is automatic. This is a very important point that is uh, widely misunderstood by um, advocates of IP. As I say in one of my blog posts, it's sticky. It's really hard to get rid of. Um, some people say, why don't you just put a notice on the front of your book saying, I hereby get rid of my copyright. Well, you could put the notice, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't actually have the effect. I mean, what if you put a notice on your body saying, I hereby get rid of my human rights? I mean, does that mean you've actually given up your human rights? No. It wouldn't be effective to do that. So unfortunately, the law doesn't even allow you to have an easy way to get rid of your copyrights. Okay, I'm going to skip slide 12. That's kind of a joke here. The point here is on slide 12, um, it's not a – don't think of it as a verb. Think of it as a noun, like you have a copyright, but you cannot copyright something. Uh, Kevin asks a question. Um, Private. Kevin, I don't know if you meant to ask this privately. It seems like a public question. Maybe you should try to change your setting to address everyone. But Kevin asks, does copyright automatically apply to formulations of combination medicines and nutritionals? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but I don't think so. I think what you're talking about is what will be covered by a patent. Copyright covers uh, – like art think of it like artistic expression, originality. Um, when you formulate medications and nutritional, that's a functional thing. Okay, it has a functional purpose, so that probably would not be covered by copyright. Copyright covers things like novels, um, lyrics to a song or the song itself, uh, a painting, a sculpture, photographs, software. Uh, we have another question here. Gwendolyn asks, when an author claims that their world in which a story takes place is copyrighted instead of just the words and that you can't write anything else in it, are they speaking to derivation or trying to assert something they don't actually have? Um, that's a good question. I think um, – well, they may not understand copyright law when they talk like this, but I think they're talking derivative works. So in other words, if you use the same background world that they created… That would probably you know, to do a sequel, let's say, that would probably be a derivative work. You know, as the copyright holder, they are the ones who have the right to authorize or to prohibit people making derivative works. So that's what they're talking about. Could also be a trademark issue, but probably it's the derivative work of copyright. Matt asks, what about covers of songs? Would they be a violation of copyright law if the cover artist did not ask for permission? Um, Yes, because it would be um, – that would probably be – it could be either a reproduction or a derivative work. If it was like an attempt to reproduce the song, even though it's not a literal reproduction, it's close to it. It's a reproduction of the song, uh, or either that or it's a derivative work. Either way, you have to get permission. Now, let me just say that there is this legislative um, thing in the U.S. called ASCAP. I forgot what, I forgot what it stands for. It's A-S-C-A-P. It's sort of like a legislative um, intermediary agency that has established royalty rates for using music, commercial music. So you can actually use someone's song if you just pay the established rate in the ASCAP manual or something. I really don't understand it, um, but it's based on copyright in the first place. Ethan. No, Give me a regular water this time. Okay, because they're bigger. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Gwendolyn. Okay, so let's go on to uh, slide 13. This, by the way, uh, I won't test you guys on this, um, but just take a look at slide 13. This is a flow chart uh, that allows you to determine uh, whether um, or when the copyright expires in a work. You can see it's very complicated. It's even more complicated than this. Um, it just shows you how arcane these statutory legislative systems are. Um, Donald asks, when is copyright obtained? Um, it's certainly when it's published by a publisher, but what about works like blogs? Well, if you look at the statute, 
it says you have a copyright as soon as an original work of authorship is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So that's when you have it. When you, as soon as you write it down, you have copyright. So as soon as you publish a blog, that minute you have copyright. In fact, you probably have it before that when you're drafting it. It would be hard to prove it, but you have it as soon as you do that. Okay. And if you think about it, it doesn't really matter when you have it because it, it, it lasts until 70 years after your death. So the starting point is only going to matter once you've made it public, really. Now, a patent um, is a little bit different than copyright because, number one, you have to apply for it. You have to, have to file a, a patent application with the United States Patent Office. What the patent covers is it gives you a property right in inventions. Okay, That is a device or a process or a, or a combination of materials. Like a new drug that performs some useful function. What it does, it gives you a limited monopoly on the manufacture, use, sale, or import of that invention. Now, this is another thing that's hard for non patent attorneys to understand, but patents do not give you the right to practice your invention. They do not. It only gives you the right to stop someone else from practicing your invention. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll give an example in a minute of how that works. Now, to get a patent, you have to, as I said, file a patent application, and it has to qualify by the rules. And the rules say, number one, it has to be the type of thing that you can get a patent for. That's called patentable subject matter. Um, Uh, patentable subject matter, uh, which, which would be uh, uh, useful invention basically, but excluded are things like the laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas. So you cannot get a patent on E equals MC squared. You cannot get a patent on a pure mathematical algorithm, and um, as of probably next month when this new patent law passes, you can't get a patent on a business method or a tax. Or a tax uh, reduction strategy, you know, things like this. What is the term of patents? Well, they used to be 17 years from the date of issuance. So you file a patent on day one. It might take one year, two years, three years, five years, sometimes 50, 50 years to, to issue. The period between when you file it and when it issues as a patent or when you give up on it which is called abandonment. It's called prosecution. It's a weird oh, it's a weird word, but it's called prosecution. That's why patent attorneys like me are called patent prosecutors. Um, that means we deal with the patent office to prosecute a patent application. So until 1995, the law was um, that once the patent finally issued, you had 17 years of term. Um, it was the law was changed in 1995 pursuant to some of the GATT, another tr another international treaty, GATT, uh, and the WTO negotiations. Uh, it was changed to the current system, which is the patent lasts for 20 years from the date of filing. Okay, but it doesn't come into force until it issues. So if you take three years for it to prosecute, then you have 17 years left. If you take five years to prosecute it, you have 15 years left. If you only take one year to prosecute it, you have 19 years of term. So basically it's a, still approximately 17 because most patents take about three years to prosecute. One reason for this change was the phenomena you might have heard of called submarine patents, submarine patents. A submarine patent, uh, that was a metaphor used to explain the effect of some of these patents that um, – so you would file a patent, and then you would keep – churning it. You could refile it over and over again for years, and on the old law, it was secret. It was kept secret during prosecution. It wasn't published until it was issued. So you would file a patent on day one, let's say 1950, let's say on some intermittent windshield wiper idea or something like that, right? 
in the meantime, 10 years later, someone else invents the same idea, and it starts being used widely in industry, and you've got this patent going secretly the whole time, and you keep it you keep it churning the whole time so the market gets bigger and bigger so that when, when you finally let your patent issue, you've got a lot of people you can sue. So the idea was like you know, 50 years later, 20 years later, all of a sudden this patent would emerge like a submarine that had been hidden and that emerges. It was all submarine patents. And it would just totally floor the entire industry because now this guy could go and extort uh, or extract patent royalties from the entire industry, like windshield, intermittent windshield wipers or uh, lots of cases like this. There's a guy named Jerome Limelson who did this. He was notorious. Uh, he was an inventor. He had, I don't know, had like 100, 200 patents when he died, and he was worth like $500 million when he died from all the royalties he had extorted from companies. I think his patent attorney was worth… 100 or 200 million dollars himself. Um, I mean, there's this Limelton Foundation out there. I mean, everyone thinks it's great, but it's really kind of disgusting in my view. Um, now, if you play that game, the longer you wait during prosecution, you're eating into your patent term. So if you take 10 years to prosecute your patent, then you only have 10 years left. Furthermore, under the new law, most patents are now published 18 months after they're filed. So even if you file it on day one and you keep it uh, prosecuting for 10 years, it's going to be public for most of that time, so people are aware that it might be coming. Okay, so patents are about 17 years. You can think about it, 20, 17, 20 years. Now, um, a patent is similar to a copyright. It allows you to go to the court. Uh, will allow you to go to a state agency and petition for this monopoly grant, and then you can sue competitors in the state's courts. Um, and again, you can penalize people for infringing your IP right. You can get an injunction from the court to make them stop, or you can get an award from the court making them pay damages, some of their money to you for violating your so-called IP right. Now, there are different types of patents. Um, in the U.S., there are utility patents, plant patents, and design patents. Now, almost every patent you've probably ever heard of is a utility patent. That means it has usefulness or function. That's just a regular type of patent, but we call them utility patents. There are also plant patents for asexually reproduced plants, and design patents are these weird hybrid of patents which um, cover the ornamental aspect of a design. Um, it's kind of like a hybrid between a patent and a copyright, and um, to be honest, not many people understand how they work. Uh, I don't quite understand how they work, and I've never filed a design patent in my life. Um, but the basic patent you're going to hear about is a utility patent. By the way, design patents have a – and I think plant patents do have a different term. They don't last as long as utility patents. They have a shorter term. But a utility patent, let's focus on that because that's the primary type of patent um, that, um, that is granted. Um, you get the patent by filing a patent application with a government agency. In America, it's the U.S. Patent Office. Most countries have their own patent office. Okay. By the way, in some other countries, there's a utility model type of patent application, um, which uh, has a shorter term. It's a, te it's a technical difference, so let's not go into it, but there is a, a UM or utility model patent in other countries. Uh, it's, uh, uh, but anyway, so if you want to get a patent, you file a patent application with the agency, and an examiner examines it, and then it issues if he thinks it satisfies all the requirements. It has to be has to be patentable subject matter. You have to be the inventor. has to be new or novel has to be non-obvious, or what's called has to have an inventive step in European countries, and it has to have utility. That means it has to actually work. So, for example, um, a patent for a perpetual motion machine would be denied automatically because uh, modern science doesn't believe perpetual motion machines can work. Um, you couldn't get a patent on the car because the car is known already. It's not new. You couldn't get a patent on a car with five wheels because that would be just a non-obvious uh, change to a current four-wheeled car, for example. So 
but he has to have all these things. Um, and I already mentioned what rights it gives the holder, the right to exclude others from making the device. Um, I don't know if I have a slide on this in this in today's lecture, so let me explain what I said earlier that why the patent does not give you the right to make your invention but only the right to stop others. Let's imagine you were the first person to think of uh, a stool. So you invent a stool, which is a four-legged um, uh, structure having four legs mounted to a seat member for allowing a person to sit on it. Okay, so you get a patent on the stool. Now, I see the stool, and I see, I see people sitting on it, and I think, hmm, I could make this stool better if I put a back on it. So I get a patent on a chair, which is a, four, you know, a, a structure having a seat member connected to four legs and with a, with a back member attached, attached to the seat member. Okay, so basically it's a stool with a back. Now, I could probably get a patent on that, but I couldn't use it because it would still be a stool. It would still be a device with a seat and four legs. So I wouldn't be able to use the stool or sell the stool, and the guy that sells the stool wouldn't be able to make a chair out of his stool. He wouldn't be able to add a back to it because I have a patent on a device with a seat, four legs, and a chair and a back. He wouldn't be able to do that. So in that case, we would probably um, make a deal with each other and cross license to each other, right? We would make a. I got, I'm going to give him permission to make mine. He's going to give me permission to make his. Or something like that, or one of us would buy the other out. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, you have to realize that basically having a patent is not permission to do something because having a patent doesn't guarantee that your device doesn't infringe on someone else's patent because it's not it's not examined for that. The examiner doesn't look at every patent out there to make sure you're not infringing. His job is to make sure your patent is new, not that it's not infringing. And if you think about it, if there's a stool known out there and there's a patent on the stool, adding a back to it could be a new idea. But it doesn't mean that it's it doesn't get it's not covered by the stool patent. Okay. I'm gonna skip over this. This is a little bit of inside baseball, but uh, the patent itself has certain parts. It has a title, it tells who the inventor is, who the owner is, if it's different from the inventor, it has a description of how you make this thing. And drawings to illustrate it, and then finally it terminates in claims, which is what you have a property right in. Um, I have an example here on slide 18 of what a, um, a patent looks uh, – one of the claims of a patent. Patent claims are always one sentence. It starts with a number and with a letter A or the, or the word A or the, and then it ends with a period. It just lays out the elements that you have to uh, have if you want to infringe this patent claim. Now, one thing that may be counterintuitive is the longer the patent claim is, the, the narrower the, uh, the narrower it is, because the more elements it has that has you have to meet to infringe that claim. A really short patent, like if I had a, a four-word patent or a short, like if I had a patent claim on, I hereby claim a device having a body. I mean that would cover almost everything anyone ever sells, right? So the shorter it is, the broader it is. The less words, the less elements, the broader it is. So every element in a claim has to be present in, in an accused device that is accused to be infringing or to be infringing. Uh, there are such a thing as dependent claims, which I'll skip over here too because this is kind of technical detail, which you really don't need to know. Um, this is the front page of a patent um, slide 20 I'm on now. Um, this is the front page of a patent which I actually wrote for my company, and this is on a laser. And you can see it's got um, – the front page has the abstract. Let's see if I can get my laser pointer going here. No, I'll give up on it. Anyway, um, that's what the front of a patent looks like. Uh, this is some of the drawings that come after the front page, some of the figures, which illustrate how the device operates. 
Okay, then this is the detailed description. Well, with background and the detailed description, there are no other claims. This is a chart. It's kind of a funny chart called the Patents Progress based upon – oh, I got this wrong last time. Uh, not Milton. Uh, who is it that did pat the uh, Pilgrim's Regress? Someone someone tell me. Anyway, there's a uh, – it was either Milton or one of those guys. Um, anyway, this shows the – you know, was it Bunyan? He might have been Bunyan. Bunyan. Anyway. You can't see the details here, but it kind of shows from the beginning all the way to like it's like heaven at the top there when you finally get a patent issue. So this is a patent lawyer's sort of way of looking at things. This is a flow chart that shows just one minor aspect of the patent prosecution process. Okay, and then this is another flow chart. Yeah, I know. I actually read Lewis's Pilgrim's Regress, but I'm trying to remember who did Pilgrim's. Was it Pilgrim's Progress? Um, John Straw. Okay, so um, yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, this is a chart here on slide 27. It's a flow chart showing how you evaluate when a computer implemented invention is patentable or not. I mean, so I'm just showing you how detailed and arcane um, this whole body of, of law is. I'm going to give you a few examples now. I think we'll take a break in about five minutes at, at, at the hour, and then we'll come back and uh, – do a few more slides and I'll field some questions. Uh, this is, I think, this is a design patent, but I'm not sure. But it's it basically it's a it's like a bumper guard that's shaped like the Holy Bible, and I guess the idea is, um, you know, you would dissuade someone from hitting your rear of your vehicle because they would see the Bible there. Uh, this is a tow puppet. I'm on slide 29 now. Someone got a patent on actually a tow puppet. Um, this is basically a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without without a crust. Someone obtained a utility patent on this. Uh, slide 31. Someone came up with a patent on pumpkin um, or jack-o'-lantern, I guess, um, um, looking garbage bags. So I guess they figure that. There's a functional advantage to having a garbage bag looking like a jack-o'-lantern around Halloween time, right? You can put your trimmings or trash outside, and you can decorate your yard at the same time. Um, this one is, is a patent on a Christmas tree stand shaped like Santa Claus so that it, you can sit it by your tree, Christmas tree, and you can water your tree at the same time. Uh, this is an initiation apparatus. Um, for a pledge for a fraternity. Um, this is an old one from 1905, if I can read the numbers right. Now, this is a patent, a famous one here, the infamous one, uh, using a laser pointer to exercise your cat. This would be a method patent. Um, and this is a pat on the back apparatus. So if you're feeling uh, down or need your self esteem boosted, you just pat yourself on the back with this apparatus. Someone actually has a Patent event. Well, I guess it's expired by now. It was 86, 96, 06. Yes, it's expired right now. Um, I'm going to skip this one here. Uh, this is a pooper scooper. I'll well, skip. This is a, uh, <laughs> a buttock cleavage revealing feature of some jeans. So basically, having a hole in the back of your jeans. Someone had a patent on that idea. Uh, this is an older one. Um, it was a. Uh, a coffin, a coffin attached to a little mechanism where, if you wake up inside the coffin, if you're actually buried on, you know, accidentally buried, you could alert people that you're you weren't really dead yet. This is like in 1891 when people were buried before they were embalmed, and on occasion people would be buried when they were actually still alive. Uh, this is a uh, <laughs> a, me a method for concealing baldness. Uh, here's a method of putting in golf. So anyone, any golfer who uses this this grip when they're putting would actually infringe this patent. Well, let's see, 9707. Yeah, it's still it's probably still in force. Uh, this was a way of determining breast size by directly measuring the breast instead of by I don't know whatever the other method is. Okay, 
So let's take a pause here. Let's take a five minute break. It's, it's 9.01 my time, 10.01 New York time. And let's come back about five or six minutes past the hour. And we will resume shortly. Okay, while we're waiting, is anyone online right now that has a microphone? I could test the passing the mic feature, which WebEx has, which we didn't have in the other. See how that would go. Anyone here have a microphone? You want to try the pass the mic feature? Let me know if you'd like to try it. I'll try to pass the mic to you. Okay. Let me, let me see Carl here. Just, Carl, I'm just going to pass the mic to you. Hello, 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 hello. Carl, can you hear me? Can you say something? Oh, hold on. Let me unmute you. No, he's not muted. He has the mic, and he's not muted. Carl, are you speaking? Because I can't hear you. Maybe Carl's muted himself. I don't hear it. Hmm. Who else wanted to try? Lloyd, let me let me try someone else. Let me try Lloyd. Lloyd. Well, I'm trying Lloyd right now. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hey, Lloyd. Hey. Maybe Carl had his own mic uh, muted or something. I'm not sure. Um, this is a good feature. We may use this in some of the Q and A sessions to um, have you know brief interchanges between um, or, or questions from some of the or comments from some of the uh, the participants. Um, good. So this sounds okay. Can everyone Hello. else hear uh, Lloyd? Hello. It's Lloyd. Oh, cool. Very good. <laughs> okay, well, we're almost ready to go. Let me uh, pass the mic back to myself or see how this works. Sure. Okay, excuse me a sec. Okay. Okay, can everyone hear me? I think we should get started just a second. Um, I think what we do is, is this. Uh, we have um, – I'm, I'm happy to go a little bit beyond time. I don't want to go too far beyond time because I'm conscious of the 
strange time zones of some people here, um, or the late time zones for them. So let's do this. Um, I'm happy to answer questions for the next you know, half an hour or so, um, but unless a lot start rolling in, what I'll do is I'll keep going on the lecture, but you can give me your questions at any time, and I'll stop and answer them. We'll just see if, how far we get on the slides. So I'm monitoring the chat. If you have questions, put them in the chat um, or interrupt me. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep going. I'm going to talk about a few um, – Okay, here's the first question from Lloyd. Can you enforce a U.S. patent outside the U.S.? Um, no. Patents are uh, patents are geographical. They're state-based or na na nation-based. Um, so if you want if you have an invention, you if you want a patent in China, you need to file a patent in China. If you want one in the U.S., you have to file one in the U.S. Um, typically, what you do is if you have an important idea, you file it. Let's say if you're an American inventor, you file an American patent application, and then within the first year, you file a PCT, that's Patent Cooperation Treaty application, which is sort of like a placeholder. And that gives you like 30 months of time to decide whether you want to file in other countries claiming the priority through the PCT filing back to the U.S. filing. So, for example, on day one, I file in the U.S. Six months later, I file a PCT application. A year and a half later, when I realize the U.S. patent is going great um, or the invention, I'm going to sell it now and it's doing well in the market. It's worth me to file it in China and Japan and Canada and Europe and Brazil or wherever. So then I might file three or four or five other national or regional application. So I might call European, Japanese, and Chinese application, for example. Um, those can be expensive because you have to use a local law firm, you have to pay local filing fees, and you usually have to pay translation fees, especially for Japan and China, which can be more expensive than the filing itself. So you're talking um, on the order of, say, roughly $10,000, $20,000 per country per filing um, for prosecution. Um, if you wanted to cover like you know half the globe, it can cost you half a million dollars just for one patent application. Uh, Matt says drugs and medical devices are approved by the FDA, but are they also patented? Um, they can be, and they usually are. So yeah, um, usually you'll get a patent, and then you, but. But like I said, a patent doesn't give you permission to do to do something, only to stop other people. So you have to if it's if it's covered by the FDA, you have to get FDA permission too. Now there's a process that's built into the patent law, which says if you have an administrative delay caused by the U.S. government, then you can extend your patent term. Now there's a limit on it, but let's so let's say that uh, you have a patent on your drug, but the, the FDA takes three years to approve it. Well, then you can tack three years onto your patent term because they figure that it's been wasted during the time you're waiting for approval. Uh, Gio Olivo, you might be wrong, but you remember seeing a video where I mentioned IP or compatible with capitalism. Um, can I elaborate? Well, I think I'll go into the, this in other – you know, the further lectures. We have six whole lectures to go. The first lecture is more to uh, familiarize you with the what IP is, okay, and, and to the extent we can get to it, some of the history, which we can cover briefly next time. Uh, but it's not compatible with capitalism because it basically they're monopoly grants by the state, which allow you to tell other people how to use their own property rights. It's, it's that simple, really. This is the basic problem with patent rights and copyrights. Um, Lloyd says, um, when people complain about drug patents in Africa, are they actually filing patents in Africa? Well, I'm not sure what complaints you're talking about. Um, what you may be – I'm not sure what complaints or what people you mean. Um, are you saying that the people that are in favor of the Western-style drug patents are complaining that the drugs can be sold or knocked off really cheaply in Africa? That may be what you're talking about. 
that's only the case because they didn't take the time to apply for a patent application in those African countries, for example. Well, you said Lloyd said AIDS drugs, but again, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, um, I think the main complaint is that a lot of other countries don't protect patent rights as much, um, so they can knock off drugs um, more and, and other things more easily. Eric Smith, trade secrets. Does the government enforce these, or are they just secrets? I thought these were forms of IP consistent with market principles and didn't require states special state privileges. Well, you would think so. Um, actually, no, they're not just secrets. If they were just secrets, you wouldn't need a doctrine of law. Uh, what they are is uh, it's a legal right to, to get the court to stop someone from releasing your secret so long as it's not widely made public yet. So for example, let's say that um, – let's say that uh, – this is probably a bad example because Coca-Cola formula is apparently not a secret anymore. Um, it's, it's, I think it's apparently a myth that the Coca-Cola secret is a trade secret. Apparently, it's been known for a long time. It's just people don't want to use it. They want to use their own formulas. But anyway, let's assume the Coca-Cola secret was a trade secret. All that means is they've taken reasonable steps to keep it secret. It doesn't mean they can guarantee that it's going to remain secret. So let's say one – let's say someone finds out the secret somehow. Um, now, if they reveal it to the world, they publish it on the internet, then it's no longer a secret. So Coca-Cola can do nothing except possibly sue that person for some kind of breach of contract or something like that. Let's say they're a former employee. But it, let's say that they haven't yet revealed it to the world, but they're, they're about to reveal it to a competitor like Pepsi-Cola. Coca-Cola could go to court and get the court to issue an injunction, and the court would tell Pepsi and the former employee or whoever this person was, you may not reveal this secret to anyone else. So that as long as it's still a secret, the court will help Coca-Cola try to keep it contained, and they'll help them with the threat of injunctions. Okay, is that clear? Okay, ask away anything else. Um, meantime, I will go on with slide 43. Um, just talking about a few common misconceptions and myths about patents and IP. Um, number one, you'll hear all the time that um, you know if we get rid of patents, we're going to hurt the small inventor, or that's the that's the primary motivation of the patent system is to help small inventors. Well, most patents don't benefit anyone. They're just wallpaper, especially small inventors. So they'll spend ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars on a patent attorney to get a piece of paper they can put in a frame and show their friends, but they never use it. They're used primarily uh, by large corporations to amass, excuse me, uh, patent arsenals, which they assemble for defensive purposes. So all these large companies have hundreds or thousands of patents, which they use sort of like as a picket fence or a porcupine defense. They have them to prevent their competitors or other people from suing them. Like you know, Intel may be afraid to sue Microsoft not only because they do business, but because um, you know, if Intel sues Microsoft for patent infringement or infringing one of Intel's patents, then Microsoft is going to look through their tens of thousands of patents and try to find one that Intel might infringe and countersue them. So companies with lots of patents either you know they, they tend to avoid each other. So they they basically have freedom to act because they have these patents. Now smaller companies don't have a defensive weapon they can use. So the companies with patents feel comfortable suing them because they're defenseless. Okay. So basically um, patents Erect barriers to entry and protect the larger companies with, uh, compared to the smaller companies. Um, another myth about the patent system is that it's a first to invent. Now, this is actually true in my understanding of most of the patent systems around the world, uh, but not of the U.S. system. Um, the U.S. system, ever since the beginning, has been based upon a first to file. In other words, if two people have the same idea and they each file a patent application on it, the one that would win in a dispute, which is called an interference proceeding, by the way, an interference proceeding, 
the one who would win um, is the one who, who invented it first if he could prove that, even if he filed second. Now, that actually is about to change apparently. I think uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, Senate Bill 93 – I'm going to blog about this later today or tomorrow probably on the Mises blog um, and also on – I'll type it here – my blog. You might want to follow this during the course, c4sif.org. That's my um, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. And I, I put a lot of regular material in there about intellectual property um, happenings. Anyway, there is a patent reform bill that's pending in Congress right now, which I think it passed before the Senate 95 to 5. Um, so I suspect it will pass in the House, and Obama will sign it. And it will uh, actually change for the first time the U.S. system to the first-to-file first system. Um, so the funny story about this is Ayn Rand, if you read Ayn Rand's defense of patent rights in her – I think it's in Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, she tries to defend the first-to-file system. She tries to explain why America is justified in having a first-to-file patent system, which we did not have. We had a first-to-invent system, so she actually didn't understand what the law was. She thought it was first-to-file. It was really first to invent. She thought it was first to file, and she tried to explain why that was the best way to go. So you can see she was trying to reverse engineer or justify what the American system was. Um, there's another myth out there uh, about poor man's patent and poor man's copyright. This sort of idea – I get asked about this about every six months from someone, um, and they say, well, can't you just um, put your idea… In a, in a sealed envelope and mail it to yourself and hold on to that as proof about when you came up with it. I mean this is a crazy idea that um, – uh, I mean I've been practicing patent law and IP law for 18 years, and I've never seen anyone do this in a serious way. This is some kind of urban legend, and this is not the way to go. Uh, I don't think it would do any good at all. You wouldn't be able to prove that it was legitimate. Yeah, this is a common that you'll hear this over and over again. Some people actually do it, but I don't think they're doing any good. They think they're doing good, but they're not. Because what are you going to do? Go to court and prove that you invented this on this date? I mean, first of all, you, if you understand copyright and patent law, you would have to understand why you would even ever need to prove this. Um, um, first of all, first invention is not a defense to patent infringement. Second of all, um, um, you know, copyright attaches as soon as you have it fixed in a medium of expression, so as long as you can prove you authored it, I mean that's not the best way to prove you authored it. Um, now, it could be theoretically a way to prove when you conceived of the idea um, for purpose of a battle with a patent, another patent key in an interference proceeding that I mentioned when you're trying to prove you invented the idea first. But if the law changes next month to where… Is first to file, then that's going to be irrelevant too. So this is a weird myth of patent law. Uh, a, a lot of you may have heard this idea too. These kind of conspiracy theorists, and they'll say things like all the big oil companies or the big car companies or whatever have um, – they've bought up all the patents to these uh, great ideas that would give you 100 mile per gallon you know, fuel injector or carburetor um, ideas. Um, the problem with this is that patents are public. I mean they're all published. So you know, even if uh, Exxon or whoever has bought up the 10 or 15 genius ideas that would allow you to get 100 miles per gallon, I mean those ideas are still published. So the proponent of this conspiracy theory should be able to do a, a free patent search on USPTO.gov and show us the patents that were bought, and you could even search for who's assigned – who owns these patents? I mean if it's been assigned to Exxon, then it would show that Exxon or some someone owns it. I mean so these are crazy um, allegations. Um, I mentioned earlier already – I knew I had this in a slide somewhere. I've already mentioned the bottom thing on slide 43 that about the right to practice. Again, for copyright, remember you can't copyright something. It's automatic. Number two, 
for patents, they do not give you the right to do what you have a patent on, only the right to stop other people. Now, you can use this right to your advantage quite often. And quite often you do have the right to make your invention because you're not infringing someone's patent. But having a patent doesn't guarantee that you don't infringe other people's patents. And I already gave you the stool example, stool chair example. Um, another kind of common myth about the patent system is uh, this this sort of mythology about the lone genius or the towering genius, you know, the, this this guy that's in his garage toiling for years, and he comes up with a eureka moment, and he comes up with something that benefits mankind. Um, the truth is that most innovation, if not virtually, excuse me, virtually all innovation um, is part of a cooperative, collaborative process, and usually is incremental in nature. Um, and of course, virtually every innovation is an improvement on the current state of knowledge. So even Einstein, or of course Einstein couldn't get a patent on his inventions or his formulas because they were um, abstract ideas. So he wouldn't be rewarded for his relativity or photon discovery or uh, E equals MC squared, um, which he didn't come up with anyway. But um, anyway, um, so this is another problem with patent law, by the way, it's, 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 it's selective and arbitrary in what it covers. It would reward practical gizmo making, but not um, fundamental physics and scientific research. Uh, and by the way, simultaneous innovation is very common. Um, in the history of patents, most, most of the uh, famous inventions you've heard of, um, there were other people that invented this either before or at the same time as the inventor who's given credit for it in history. Uh, so simultaneous invention is a very common thing. And the point of this is that um, uh, it's often said that if you don't grant someone a monopoly in their uh, inventions, then they would never have been created in the first place. Well, this is just factually false. I mean, first of all, it would be eventually it would be invented eventually, probably, maybe soon after or long after, but it's going to be invented by someone eventually. You know, when technology gets to a certain stage, then it becomes ripe for all these creative people to use it and take it to the next level. Um, I mean, the light bulb would eventually have been invented, even if Ed Edison hadn't done it, for example. Um, and not only that, like I said, quite often there's other people working on it at the same time. Um, you know, there are three or four people that came up with the calculus at the same time. Uh, three or four people were working on the transistor at the same time. It wasn't just Shockley. Um, okay. There's another uh, misunderstanding about patents, um, and that is that uh, patent infringers are are just someone who copied your idea from you. In fact, you'll see people like um, Jane L. Shulman. They'll say, "Well, you know, if you don't if you don't want to, you know, if you don't believe in copy and in, in patent and copyright, just don't copy my damn invention." Well, but that assumes that um, Patent infringement has to do with copying, but of course it doesn't. Copyright does. Patent does not. Remember, to infringe someone's patent, all you have to do is make, use, or sell the device that is covered by the claims of their patent. That's it. Even if you independently invented it, that's not a defense. It's not an excuse. Even if you invented it first but had it secret, you know, kept it private, and someone else – independently invented it and patented it later, they can stop you from using your own ideas. Um, in fact, most patent lawsuits, um, the plaintiff never even alleges that the defendant copied what they did. And in fact, from the statistics I've seen and from my own experience in the lawsuits I've been um, involved with, um, I, I've never in my experience seen a case where uh, a client that I'm talking to who was accused of infringing a patent or who's worried about infringing a patent, they never did learn about it from the other company's patents or even their product. Usually they're just toiling away, making their own products, and they're coming up with different um, designs to make their products work. And as they're doing this, someone says, hey, uh, that – the way that our circuit's configured, I'm afraid it might look too much like claim 17 
of patent number 6,221,512. So they go and study it. They get a patent lawyer. They study the claims, and they go, I'm not sure. I mean I don't know if it's the same thing. It looks kind of the same, but I'm not sure. But the point is they didn't get it from the patent. They didn't copy it. They came up with it themselves, but then they're now they're in danger of, uh, of uh, infringing the patent, and this is the common way patents are enforced. You just allege that someone infringes your claim. You never allege they copied it because they usually didn't. Okay, let's go to slide 45. And by the way, I'm, uh, any questions are welcome now. We're getting close to um, – I'd be happy to go another, uh, say, 10 minutes or so, um, or more if we need to. Uh, another, as I mentioned, uh, there's another myth that um, that we had copyrighted common law, but that was what's called common law copyright. And as I mentioned, that was more like a trade secret right. That was just a very narrow right to prevent publication of an unpublished uh, manuscript. Um, I have, there's a good uh, quote here by Lord Camden, and he said that claims that copyright arose in common law are – I'm reading my quote here on page uh, 45. They are founded on patents, privileges, star chamber decrees, and the bylaws of the stationer's company. And by the way, we'll get to the stationer's company in the history section later um, next class. And all of them, the effects of the grossest tyranny and usurpation, in the very last places in which I would have dreamt of finding the least trace of the common law. So disabuse yourselves of the myth that copyright as we now know it existed at common law. Um, also, it's commonly said, especially by many libertarians who advocate IP, that um, that it's a natural right and it's based in the natural law. This is actually not true. It's ahistorical, and we'll get into this later in the history. Um, also, as for the evidence, for those who have a utilitarian approach to patents and copyrights and say that you know um, we need them because it encourages innovation, it encourages um, creativity. Um, without it, we would have less, and we'd all be worse off. Well, they just don't have any evidence to back this up, and they never even try. Um, it's also based upon the this myth that we have a benevolent state. You know, we have a benevolent FDA, um, but the truth is that the state taxes and regulates, distorts, penalizes, and incinerates and bombs things. It's really not out for the little guy, right? And giving them a tiny monopoly privilege they can use doesn't overcome for all the damage the state does to them in other ways. So we've got to get rid of this idea that the state is you know, looking out for the little guy with these with these uh, with these monopoly grants. Um, all right, let's quickly go over the in the remaining time we have over the other types of IP. I already mentioned trademark. Um, what it is? Here's kind of the more formal definition. It's a word, phrase, symbol. Or design used to identify the source of goods or services. It's sometimes called a service mark in that case, by the way, um, and to distinguish them from the goods or services of others. And as I uh, – Coca-Cola, I've got the little R in the circle there. It means registered trademark. Um, identifies their products as coming from them, um, Pepsi – as distinguished from Pepsi. Okay, So what it does is it… It prohibits the use of confusingly similar marks to identify your goods, and every 10 years you can register the trademark over and over again. As long as the company and the products in business, theoretically, they can last forever, okay, so every 10 years. And I've already mentioned what, um, what trade secrets are. Some examples of trade secrets would be um, databases, customer lists, okay. Now, these are largely protected by state law, although there are federal federal aspects to it. Now, one, let me mention one disadvantage to relying on trade secret is that, uh, as I mentioned, it's possible for someone else to independently invent the – let's say you're let's say you're using as a secret some invention, some innovative process, okay, to make a chemical or a process, uh, to, to make a chemical or something or a product. If someone else comes up with this 30 years later, then they file a patent on it. They can then stop you from using your own invention, even though you were first, because they have a patent. You didn't copy it. In fact, you came up with it first. 
So this is one danger of trade secrets. So this one problem of patents is that it makes people reluctant to actually use trade secrets. And in fact, there's another um, – I just had a debate with a patent lawyer in Ohio about IP law, um, and he pointed out that one advantage of the patent system is that it encourages disclosure of ideas that would otherwise be kept secret. Thanks, Danny. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to stop in about five minutes anyway, so you won't miss too much. Uh, Carl says, "Doesn't the FBI investigate violation of trade secrets?" Yeah, I didn't mention that, but so trade secret is largely um, um, state law, but there is a federal. Uh, I think it's the Espionage Act, and there's another federal law which uh, makes it a federal crime in some cases to steal trade secrets. So they do investigate that sometimes. That's that's correct. Although it's the body of the law is still largely state-based, uh, like trademark used to be. Copyright and patent are completely federal-based um, in the U.S. we're talking about. Um, but let me just mention one thing, and I'll wrap it up here. Um, what I was going to say was the original idea, if you actually look at the Constitution and the Patent Act, what it actually literally says is that um, um, if you file a patent application… Then we'll give you a monopoly. But if you think about it, it's just like a bargain. What they're telling the public is – I'm sorry, what they're telling the inventor is if you tell the world how to make your idea because we're going to publish this, if you disclose it, that's why it's called a disclosure or a detailed description, then we'll give you a monopoly. So the exchange is you get a temporary monopoly in exchange for telling the world about your idea. Um, now, this also is said to work as an incentive to innovate, but the main literal incentive is to disclose your idea. The theory is that without a patent system, um, companies would keep everything secret, and so you'd have less free disclosure and trading of ideas. So the idea is that the patent system encourages disclosure of ideas earlier than otherwise. Even if you can't use the idea yet, you can start studying it and researching it, and as soon as the patent – uh, expires, then you're free to compete with the uh, company and use the ideas, uh, etc. Um, the problem is, number one, um, this uh, companies still do keep some things secret. Okay, so in other words, most products that uh, are disclosed, uh, sorry, most products that are patented, the innovative aspect of the product. Would have been revealed to the public anyway by the selling of the product. In other words, you know, if I have a new mousetrap design, if I start selling it, the public is going to see the new design. So the patent system in that case, if I have a patent on that mousetrap design, the patent the public is not benefited by the filing of the patent application because they would have known what the patent was like anyway. So the disclosure that it encourages is superfluous to what would have been disclosed anyway. So there's very little new disclosure that the patent system encourages. On the other hand, as I mentioned, um, many companies are afraid of uh, being sued for practicing their own inventions, so they're afraid to keep things secret. So what a lot of these companies do, they cannot afford to file a patent application because it can be expensive. So what they do is they publish their ideas. Okay, in some journal or some publication service for a fairly minimal fee of one or two or three hundred dollars. They publish it on purpose to make their ideas public domain or prior art to prevent someone else from independently reinventing this idea later and filing a patent on it. So the effect of the patent system is to force companies that are not getting a patent in exchange for this. To reveal their secrets to the world defensively. So basically, it distorts the market and makes companies give up secrets that they otherwise would have had a right to, to maintain um, just to avoid being the victim of a patent of a lawsuit. I think I will stop here. If anyone else has any particular questions now, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, I'll wait a second to see if anyone has any questions and uh, Otherwise, I will see you all. Let me ask, would anyone be interested – would anyone here um, be interested in a um, um, an office hour session, let's say 1 o'clock 
p.m. two o'clock p.m. New York time on like Thursdays. Or was it, I don't know if we would need to do that yet. I did that for my last course. I don't know if we need to do that yet. I would do it if anyone wants to. Yeah, I think I won't do it this week because I didn't mention it or didn't list it, but I'm happy to do it if there's a demand for it and a need for it. I could do it on the weekends too. Um, it's hard to find the best time for office hours. We can discuss this in the course um, discussion page. Any further questions? Go ahead, Gwendolyn, about Feist. You can find Feist, by the way, on the just search uh, just search it on Wikipedia, the Feist case. So Gwendolyn has a question about Feist. Go ahead. I'm, I'm waiting. Will the data in a wiki be considered a database under Feist? Well, I guess that, that depends on whether it's original. I mean, if it's just if it's a mere compilation of data, like mere facts. I mean, the, the, the typical examples would be a database or um, a, a map or a phone book listing, something like that. Maybe seismic data, something like that. Um, but I think a lot of wikis have original contributions, right? Um, uh, just take a look at the, the FICE case. You'll see how they formulate it, but um, it depends on what the wiki had, when the one – I mean, yeah, if, it's, if there's an actual article written by individuals, I think those are creative. Those are original works of authorship. Those are typically going to be protected by copyright. Now, the wiki may attempt to have a Creative Commons type license to make it somewhat open source. Whether those licenses are effective or not uh, is a different question. I have some questions about that. Uh, in any case, they're still copyright. They're still protected by copyright. Uh, Gwendolyn says the um, the software itself would, but the data is a different issue. I'm not sure what you mean about. I thought a wiki was a online way of uh, having a collaboration of adding information to something. So I, what I'm saying is it depends on the nature of the information, whether it would be um, a database or not. When will I cover – Donald says, when will I cover questions to the professor? Uh, I usually cover them as they come in. If there's some that I've missed, please point me to them. I, I, I try to subscribe to all the forums. Um, are there any that I've missed, Donald? I usually answer them dynamically during the week as, as they come in, or sometimes I'll save them for a Q&A session. But if we may not have one at least this week, I, I'll answer them. Gwendolyn says the software that runs the wiki might be under open source, but the data uh, the wiki accesses is independent of the software. That could be. I mean, we'd have to look at the particular case for the answer, but you know, just basically think of um, original expressions of idea as protected by copyright. Mere data is not. Mere facts are not. Uh, Matt uh, said he read against IP on his iPod and liked it and didn't take too long. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. And there's an audio version by one of our members here, Jock. Uh, Lloyd said – Lloyd talks about the Wikipedia has an uh, explanation of the license they're using. Um, I agree, but the point is you wouldn't need a license if it wasn't protected by copyright in the first place. Okay, So whether there's a license or not I mean, sort of presupposes that there is a copyright in the data. So the, the, the first question is whether there's a copyright in the, in the information or the material.
Okay, guys. So I will be in contact with you during the week on the forum. And any of you feel free to email me anytime. Um, let's have my email here. Again, that's my email, not Danny's. Um, and otherwise, I'll talk to you. I'll see you on next Monday night. Good night, everybody. Enjoyed it.